the conference-wide safety Sabbath, but I wasn't here last week, so the decision was made to do the safety Sabbath stuff today instead so I could participate with you. And what that means for you is that after we are done with worship, we are going to have a fire drill. And please humor us because we are hoping that we will never have any reason to need to evacuate this building. But that's just hope, right? And reality could overrule us. So please, when we are done, we're going to have our closing song, closing prayer, and then we will not be sounding an alarm, but it will be time for all of us, instead of going straight to eat, we're going to first go out to the parking lot, okay? That's how we're going to prepare to be safe. Any questions? Okay. Let's pray. God, our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to praise your name and to open up your word together as a family, to dig into it and to figure out what it is that you have sent us here to learn this morning. We know that you are in our presence because you have promised to be in our presence when we gather. And so we're not asking you to be here, for we know you already are, but instead to make your presence here known to us, to anoint us, to give us wisdom that we cannot have except through the anointing from heaven. And allow us, Father, to connect to you through this spoken word. Let no glory be given to anyone except yourself. And I ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Well, today, today is what I like to call a sermon of obligation because... As you know, this whole weekend is considered to be holy time for many Christians, for actually most Christians, pretty much all Christians <laughs> across the world. But it's holy time not just because it's Easter weekend. Easter is tomorrow. Yesterday is the day that we call Good Friday. Prior to that, Maundy Thursday in some circles, right? So the whole weekend is holy for that reason. But did you know today is also the first day of Passover? Since I didn't get an answer except from the little kids, I'm going to assume that you did not know that today was the first day of Passover. Okay, good. At least some of us know. Right. And so these holidays are related. Easter and Passover are related one to another, though of course they are not identical. And today we're going to discuss their relationship. So today is a sermon of obligation because the timing of the calendar has decided what we're going to talk about today. Now, I'm going to preface this message to you by telling you exactly where I stand with regard to these holidays because I'm aware that there is a fair amount of controversy out there um, in certain circles regarding not only just Easter and its kind of pagan origins, but about Passover and how to understand it and keep it. So I don't want you to mishear me today nor misrepresent me in the future. So I'm going to tell you straight up exactly where I fall, okay? In today's message, we're going to discuss Passover almost exclusively. It is true. It is a true thing that the word Easter does appear in the traditional King James Version of the Bible in Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. However, the Greek word underneath that word Easter, the Greek word which is translated into Easter in this instance, is the word Pascha which is the Greek word for the Passover, not only holiday, but the whole season of Passover. And in fact, every single other English translation of the Bible for this verse in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, uses the word Passover. So it's not accurate to say that the word Easter is unbiblical because it actually does appear there. But it's also not accurate to say that the word Easter is biblical because it's kind of there by accident. It's actually describing Passover. So while I'm not going to condemn Easter per se, I recognize that millions of sincere believers connect strongly to that word and this holiday, including maybe you. Um, I personally gravitate more toward the Passover. I find a greater scriptural connection there. 
Um, and I, I want to talk about that today because through the lens of Passover is, is the concept that the apostles really had in their minds when they wrote these things down. And certainly Luke, the author of the book of Acts, that's what he was trying to get at. So, all of that being said, we're starting from this position where I'm going to talk to you about Passover as I believe the important thing to talk about. But that being said, I have not, do not, and will not ever advocate the keeping of the ancient Israelite feasts as a test of either fellowship or salvation. I will not ever do that. Passover was only one of seven such feasts in the Old Testament. And there are those, both within Adventism and without Adventism, who really will insist that doing what the Bible says about these holidays is going to be mandatory for all Christian believers today. I am not one of those people. However, that being said, <laughs> see, I kind of fall somewhere in the middle like I do with most of these polarizing binary controversies that we have, you know? I do not believe that we need to keep the feasts in that kind of Old Testament way, nor do I believe that we get to throw them away and not discuss them at all. I actually believe that you cannot fully understand the meaning of the book of Revelation without first understanding the seven feasts in the Old Testament. That's one of the major literary themes that runs all the way through the book of Revelation. So if you're ignorant of those feasts, there's going to be a lot in Revelation you'll never grab onto. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to do today. We are going to understand Passover today. We're going to truly get to the heart of what it means, both historically and prophetically. Are you ready? Buckle up, guys. This is going to be big. <clears throat> Let's start with the basics. Passover is, on its very surface, a memorial to the liberation of Israel from slavery in Egypt. God had instructed Moses to lead the people out of their captivity, but Moses' request to Pharaoh the king went largely unheeded. And so, God sent many plagues onto the land, sometimes even prompting Pharaoh to consent to the freedom of the Israelites. But then as soon as God's mercy intervened on the situation and the plagues subsided, Pharaoh just went back to refusing again. And so the 10th plague would be the final one. Pharaoh's impenitence had reached a point that God would not permit it to pass. So Pharaoh and all of Egypt was going to be brought to its knees, whether they liked it or not. That was the purpose of that final plague. And we read about it in Exodus chapter 11, starting in verse 4. Then Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. So this was an indiscriminate judgment. If you were geographically present in the land of Egypt on that day, of any class of people, of any ethnic background, this was going to happen to you. Now, does that seem intense? This is a terrible price to pay, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. And so, our merciful God gives everybody a way out. He said, this is going to happen, but if you don't want it to happen to you, here's what you do. Just as God always gives his people a way out. We see that pattern all the way in Egypt. All the people had to do is listen to God and obey. So in Exodus 12, 3, God says, Speak to all of the children of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So they were to choose a lamb 
to die instead of or in place of the firstborn of the household. And they were to do this choosing on the tenth day of the month. Verse 6 says, Now you shall keep that lamb until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill that lamb at twilight. And so this same lamb that they chose on the tenth day would be slaughtered as a sacrifice on the fourteenth day of the month and thus would die in place of the firstborn. Verse 7, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And that was what they were supposed to do. In the process of, of what we've just read, in verse 46, it says that none of the lamb's bones were to be broken. And that's an important detail. Do not break any of the bones of the lamb. So then they were to take the blood and cover the entrance to their household with the blood of this sacrificed lamb. In verse 13, we read that the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, this is God speaking, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So in other words, when God sees this blood of the lamb, he passes over, sparing the life of those inside. And that means, friends, that God's justice and God's mercy meet at the blood of the lamb. I'm glad I heard at least a couple amens on that. And so this, takes, this took place as prophesied. And God reclaimed the firstborn of every household in Egypt except those that were covered by the blood of the lamb, whether they were Israelite or Egyptian. The blood provided mercy. And so this plague happened, and it just destroyed the little bit of Egypt that was left after the first nine plagues. Pharaoh, who is now without his oldest son, he decides to finally let the Israelites go for real, and Passover has been celebrated ever since. I mean, we, they, you know, Pharaoh changes his mind one last time and pursues them down to the Red Sea, and then we have the miracle of the parting of the sea and all that stuff. But that's the finale to everything that we've just talked about, where the scribes and the chief priests heard about Jesus and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all of the people were astonished at his teaching. Now we're going to build a timeline to see when this actually happened, okay? When we start in the book of John, John chapter 12, verse 1 tells us, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who was, who Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Okay, so Passover is on a Friday. We know that because Jesus died on the Passover day. So subtract six days, and where are we? Nope, try again. It's the Sabbath, right? We're talking about the Sabbath. This is the last Sabbath that Jesus lived through on this side of the cross, right before he went to the cross. And he went to Bethany to spend it with his friends. So following that same book, same chapter, verses 12 and 13, we see the next day, the day after that final Sabbath, a great multitude that had come up to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. So the day after Sabbath is a day that we call Sunday, right, correct, Sunday. And on that Sunday, Jesus goes to Jerusalem and he is welcomed there as a king. Now that event is what has been memorialized in our Sunday-keeping Christian brethren churches as Palm Sunday. Okay, and that happened last week. Yeah, this past Sunday. Um, that is still celebrated. It kind of had its origin in the Catholic Church, and it, it has bled from there to be celebrated by a large percentage of Sunday-keeping churches, notably the Anglicans and Lutherans, um, but certainly beyond that as well. So Mark is going to now pick up the story, right? He also records the triumphal entry on that Sunday before Jesus was killed. And he goes on from there to say, Mark 11, verse 12, Now the next day, 
Day after Sunday is the day we call Monday. So now it's Monday, the final Monday of Christ's life. When they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now this is the story of the fruitless fig tree. Jesus sees it, discovers it looks great but has no actual fruit. He curses it and it withers. But in between, according to Mark's version, in between the cursing of the fig tree and the finding of the fig tree withered, there is an event. Jesus does something. And that event is verses 15 through 17 when Jesus cleanses the temple, turns over the tables and chases out the money changers and that whole big drama. So that is the immediate context of why they decided now was the time to kill him. They'd been kind of casually discussing it for a long time, but after he cleansed the temple, they said, enough is enough. We got to get this done. This man needs to go away. And we see that, of course, in verse 18 of that same chapter. So that means they decided this the day after Palm Sunday. If the 14th is Passover on Friday, that makes Monday. Who can do some math? What date is the Monday of that week if Friday is the 14th? Don't be shy. No, 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 work backwards. Friday is the 14th, work backwards to Monday. It is the 10th. It's the 10th. It's the same day that the Passover lambs were chosen to be sacrificed. Jesus was chosen as a sacrifice on the same day that the Passover lambs were chosen to be the sacrifice. Okay, we're just getting started. <laughs> We know that he died on the Passover. That's well known. That would be the 14th. So he fulfilled that very nicely. And he, of course, shed a lot of blood at his death, like the lambs were supposed to. They were to be slaughtered in a very specific manner to shed their blood. And Jesus, of course, shed a ton of blood at his death. Um, there have been many movies <laughs> about that subject. So if you are doubtful that he shed a lot of blood any given movie on the subject is going to tell you that that was the truth. And then that sacrifice that he gave on the day of Passover, which was given to take the place of the one who truly deserves to die, right? Me and you. See all the parallels? That salvation, that sacrifice offers salvation to anybody who is covered by the blood of the Lamb, just like in Passover. Peter goes on to specifically say that in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, that we were redeemed by this blood. That is the mechanism by which we are saved. And so we see that, he, that Jesus meets all the kind of surface criteria of being a Passover sacrifice. Christ also endured mind-boggling just agony and torment leading up to the cross. But, did you know, he did all of that without any broken bones? Amazingly, astoundingly, against all earthly odds, and especially given the fact that he died on Passover. And the Jews were very clear that they did not want any bodies on the crosses on the, their, their high holy day. So they went to, uh, to Pilate, and they asked if the bodies of the prisoners, including Jesus, could be taken off the cross before sunset, when they, in their minds, sunset after the Passover sacrifice was when it all really began, right? So here's what we read in John chapter 19. Because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. I'm bringing this up even though it's a little bit gruesome, but it, 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 it kind of illustrates the point here. If you need to get a prisoner off the cross, breaking the, breaking the legs was the most effective way to do it because the, the physics of being crucified were such that the legs end up bearing most of your body weight uh, after 
you know, and then once your muscles in your legs go numb and get, start to cramp, you kind of relax and then it hangs, you know, you hang your body weight from your hands, which are nailed to the cross. So just imagine now, you come along and somebody breaks the legs, the bones in your legs, you can't support. You know, if you're kind of resting, you can support every once in a while, and even you actually, if you're, if you're pulling your chest wall out like this, you can't even breathe, really, unless you relax the stresses on your chest wall. So, really, a crucified victim would have to push down on his legs at least every once in a while simply to breathe. So, if you break the legs of a crucified victim, you're going to suffocate to death in minutes, if not seconds. So they said, all right, we need the bodies off. Let's go break the legs. And, and we see that in verses 32 and 33, that the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, I find this amazing I find it as amazing <laughs> as the last-ditch effort to make peace with the French army in 1798, which miraculously failed, leading to the causing of that mortal wound in 1798. When you realize that people tried their very best to get in the way of prophecy, but God doesn't allow that because God's will be done. Amen? Amen. So, they tried to break Jesus' legs in order to miss the fulfillment of the prophecy, but they didn't do it. All right, now all of this is pretty cool, I think. But again, we're just getting started. <laughs> the actual Passover sacrifice was supposed to happen at dusk. That is when the traditional Jews understood the beginning of a day to occur, which is, of course, why we understand Sabbath beginning at sundown on Friday instead of midnight in between Friday and Saturday. So, in other words, the temple sacrifices and the sacrifices in, in all the individual homes had been offered already the night before Jesus died. Since he died at the ninth hour, so to speak, or approximately 3 p.m. on the 14th. So my question to you would be, how did Jesus fulfill the temple sacrifice, which happened on what we would understand as Thursday night, and they understood it as the, the early hours of Friday, how can he fulfill that if it happened 20 or so hours before he actually died on the cross? Anyone want to take a guess? How did he fulfill it on Thursday night? I think somebody's got to know, and you're just afraid of being wrong. <laughs> All right, if you pull out your bulletins, we've got something special happening next week. What are we doing next week? Communion. Jesus gave us the communion supper on Thursday night the night before he died. The Passover supper was the beginning of that. Communion happened after they were done eating their Passover supper. And this new supper, so to speak, of bread and juice is the new covenant believer's Passover. So when we partake in the communion supper, we are identifying with the holiday of Passover. Since Christ is the fulfillment of Passover, he says, all right, that old feast is now obsolete and it doesn't mean anything anymore. The new feast is going to remember me, going to remember Christ. And we see in Matthew 26 an account of that, starting in verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it. By the way, as they were eating, right? So this is in conjunction with a larger supper. Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hallelujah for Jesus. They're supposed to eat his body because he's the Passover lamb. 
which you are supposed to eat. And even our understanding of using grape juice instead of alcoholic wine is because of Passover. In Exodus 12, 15, we see seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. You see, leaven or yeast is a fermenting agent. Therefore, we conclude that this fermenting agent would have had no place in the Passover meal, either in Moses' day or in Jesus' day. And so our decision to use grape juice is not simply because our church disapproves of alcohol. Do you see that? It actually has its root in Scripture that way. Non-alcoholic grape juice. And so Christ symbolically died on Thursday night through the communion supper when the actual lambs were being offered in their own individual houses and at the temple. And then he literally died the following afternoon on the cross. And the timing of his physical death on the cross was not an accident either, which I'm, again, assuming you know. We have seen already that Jesus died about the ninth hour. Can you tell me what other important event happened at the ninth hour every day? The evening sacrifice. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I had such faith in you that even in my notes, it says, that's right. I just believed you would get that answer. <laughs> okay. For anyone who does not know, twice daily in the temple system, the priests would offer sacrifice, once in the morning and once in the evening at the third and the ninth hours, so we understand. These sacrifices were not made on behalf of any individual person or any specific sin. Rather, the priests would purchase the various lambs with temple treasury money from, you know, whoever was selling the lambs, and then once it became their own, they would sacrifice their own lambs on behalf of all repentant sinners who were joined together in faith at that given moment when the sacrifice was offered. And so this daily sacrifice, so to speak, this twice daily sacrifice was literally a sacrifice in which you could only participate by faith. It was designed by God for the poor and the maimed and the unclean or the traveling, right? All the people who could not bring their own offerings to the temple. For them, these twice daily offerings were an open invitation by God to come to him in faith. So when Jesus died at the ninth hour, he died when the lamb for the Passover evening sacrifice faith offering was given, was slain. He died at the same time that the daily sacrifice was offered on the day of Passover. And so therefore, through the communion supper, Christ demonstrates his invitation to the religiously oriented, the people like you and me, right? The knowledgeable, the churchgoers, those of us who are inclined to do things like eat the communion supper, right, for the perpetuation of the actual church, to pass this knowledge on to our kids in our community. But by actually dying at the time of the Passover evening daily sacrifice, Christ demonstrates his invitation to everybody, all who would come to him in faith, whether you know all the right words or not, whether you know exactly the right action and ritual or not, it doesn't matter because Jesus is available to you at no cost but your faith, which he promises to provide. He makes it so easy, right? We are the ones who make religion so complicated. Jesus makes it so easy. He just says, come on, just say yes to me, and I'll do everything else. Just say yes. And let's not forget the important detail needed to properly fulfill the, daily, the temple daily sacrifice. Not just the timing of it, but the ownership of the sacrifice. Okay? The daily sacrifice was available to everybody because it came not from an individual household, but rather from the priesthood itself. 
purchased at some point from somewhere with temple treasury money. And in that one particular regard, it's a really good thing that Judas Iscariot's love of money won the day over his love for Jesus because by that betrayal, Jesus became a sacrifice offered by the priests paid for with temple treasury money, fulfilling that detail of the Passover. He was slain at, slain at the ninth hour after being purchased by the priesthood, therefore perfectly fulfilling both the daily sacrifice and the Passover at the same time. Now consider this amazing detail. Amazing. Uh, by the way, I love this topic. It's the topic that keeps on giving. I, I'm not even going to claim that this, and I'm exhausting it for you because every time I think I've figured it all out, I figure out something else. This is the topic that just gives and gives and gives and gives and gives, which is why our, the Bible actually says Christ, our Passover. He's the living Passover. He's everything about it. So this amazing detail, okay? By the time that Solomon got around to building the first static temple, the non-portable temple, Israel was large. And the sanctuary system was well established. So therefore, there were many and many, and I do mean many, think thousands of animals that were brought there for sacrifice throughout the year. What do you think happened to all of that blood? In the wilderness sanctuary, the extra blood was poured at the base of the fiery altar. And that kind of worked for them because the wilderness sanctuary was portable, right? So even if it gets a little dirty, you're going to move and you pour it into the ground somewhere else. But the temple was not portable, so the temple had a plumbing system. The excess blood, which was not used in ritual, was still poured at the base of the altar, but it was flushed from there out through the plumbing system and into the valley which lay beyond the temple. In that valley, there was a brook or a river. It is called the Kidron Valley, the whole valley. And it's referred to in the Old Testament as the plains of Kidron, the brook Kidron, all these various names. And it's actually quite large. It runs a long distance, not just right there by the temple. In the Old Testament, the Brook Kidron is always referred to as a place of death. It's where idols go and rebellion goes to die. But then strangely, in Jeremiah, it's also a place that God claims as holy to himself. And I hope there's at least someone in the room who just heard me say that some place can be both death and disease and also blessed by God at the same time. And you're thinking, hmm, that sounds like outside the camp. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Somebody was paying attention two or three weeks ago when I, <laughs> when I talked about that, right? So the brook Kidron was a big deal in the Old Testament, but it only shows up one time in the New Testament. And it's in John 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. So now immediately following the Passover supper, the last supper, the communion supper, Christ now crosses over the brook Kidron, and that is where this river of lamb's blood would have been flowing out of the temple at the same time, right? Because that's, that's when that sacrifice happened. Do you see why this is significant? God passed over the Lamb's blood in Egypt. Christ passed over the river of Lamb's blood in Jerusalem on the day of Passover. And thus, he demonstrates to us and to everybody who's willing to give it enough thought to realize this, he's demonstrating that he is in fact God, that he claims ownership of the Passover event. It is his. And because, I'm not even done yet, guys, because that river would have been blood 
and water mixed together, because blood congeals, right? So you need something to flush it down the, the plumbing system. So it's a river of blood and water. Therefore, Christ has to conform to that detail also. And lo and behold, in John 19, 34, we see that one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and came out. Every detail, friends, every single biblical Passover detail fulfilled by Christ. And that's just the day of Passover. You see, following the Passover, the day after Passover in the Bible is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is something that's kind of been lost in our modern religion, or modern manifestations of Judaism kind of do Passover as an eight-day event. But biblically, it's a one-day event followed by a seven-day event in the middle of which is yet another day, right? So it's three holidays back to back in the Bible. And Jesus fulfills them all. The day after Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Biblically, it's a separate holiday from Passover. And the scripture evidence suggests it's actually of greater importance to the ancient Jews than was the actual day of Passover itself. Which is why in John, when they're discussing getting the bodies off the cross, it says because the following day was a high Sabbath. So not Friday, the day of Passover. That wasn't the big deal. It was the day after, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they needed those bodies off the cross. To them, the unleavened bread was more important. So <clears throat> on that day, and the six days following, no yeast was to be consumed or even found inside the home of a believer. It was supposed to be like it never even existed. Yeast is representative of sin. I hope you know that. If you need a proof text, see me afterwards. But it's representative of sin. So this was supposed to be a time of extreme self-examination, right? No yeast means no sin. Looking at your life, figuring out what you should give to God and let him take away so you can be more in line with him. Well, what did Jesus do on this day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day after his death? He rested. Where did he rest? In the tomb. That's exactly right. He rested in the tomb. The man without sin died a criminal's death, but the sin that he took on to himself clearly must not stay on him because he was going to rise again, triumphant over sin and death and the grave on Sunday. And so that means just as the people were to be ridding their homes of sin, so too must Messiah, who became sin at his death, he must also be rid of that sin. And so, of course, that happened. Because the following day he was alive again. Hallelujah. Right? So this is an understanding we only get really from the Feast of Unleavened Bread and from the sanctuary system, right? How does sin travel beyond the sacrifice? And that's why we have the sanctuary to tell us what ultimately happens to sin. So it's important for us to recognize that Jesus kept the Sabbath even when he was dead. That's how important the Sabbath is to God. Even dead, he kept the Sabbath. But it's more important to recognize the purpose of that rest, right? The ridding of the yeast, the preparation for resurrection. This is the time when all of that sin left the sacrifice and went to the heavenly sanctuary. Then two days after Passover was a third holiday, which the Old Testament calls first fruits or wave sheaf. We read about it in Leviticus 23, verses 10 and 11. When you come into the land which I give you, this is God speaking, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So on this holiday, an offering was made to God. That was kind of the whole point of this holiday. And when you did it correctly, the Lord accepted that offering and would bless the harvest to come. Okay, so verse 14. 
says, You shall eat neither bread, nor parched grain, nor fresh grain, until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And so again, the emphasis here is that this holiday is specifically about giving something to God, offering something to God. The first fruits of the harvest to come was to be given to God. Okay. You say, all right, I'm trying to follow you, but pastor, Jesus did the offering on Friday, not Sunday. So what are you talking about? Good point. You are correct. Friday is when he accomplished the offering, but it's not when he presented that offering to the Father. On Sunday morning, speaking to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, we read in John 20, verse 17, that Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So it's Sunday morning. It's resurrection day. It's the feast of first fruits. And this is when Jesus presented himself before the Father as an offering for mankind. Leviticus told us that this offering should include the first fruits of the harvest. And wouldn't you know it, when we read in Matthew 27, we read, Behold, this is at the moment of Jesus' death, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Graves were opened at the death of Jesus, and their occupants emerged after the resurrection of Jesus. The first fruits of the harvest of the earth, do you see? And we even have a little hint that they accompanied Jesus back to heaven when he left just prior to, to Pentecost. It's just a hint. We're not allowed to make a doctrine around this, okay? It's just a hint. But we find that hint in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts to men. When he ascended on high, that's 10 days before Pentecost, he gave gifts to men. That's the day of Pentecost. So the middle part where he led captivity captive is in between. Captivity would be people. Captive to himself means they followed him there. In fact, some versions of the Bible say he led captivity in his train. Okay? So somebody seems to have gone back to heaven with him. And we assume, we conclude that it would have been the harvest of the earth risen on the day of the resurrection. So my point here is that Jesus was so much the fulfillment of Passover that he fulfilled its two sub-holidays also, Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits. His entire death and resurrection experience is the antitype. It's the fulfillment of all of these things. In fact, these events are the reason that Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits were instituted in the first place. Now, I'm going to say something that I hope you follow here. I believe that the epicenter of all history is the cross of Calvary. And that all events, both past tense and future tense, from that event cascade from that moment in all directions. For us, because we are trapped in time, we perceive this as all of the events in history leading up to the cross in a perfect way. But from God's perspective, living outside of time, I believe he sees the Old Testament and the before Christ events as proceeding from the cross, which is why it's all so perfect, right? You know, I'm trying to, I know this is complicated. Here's what I'm trying to say. 
we often approach Jesus fulfilling the law as if he somehow conformed to all of the aspects of the law. And I'm just trying to change that paradigm. I don't think Jesus conformed to anything. I think the law exists to describe Jesus. And I think Passover exists as a prophecy of what Jesus was going to do, right? And so if you start at the cross as the, like, origin Genesis point of history and, and that bomb of that event just explodes in all directions, then, of course, everything prior to the cross leads up perfectly to the cross if the cross was the starting place. So his death does not fulfill the holiday. His death is the holiday. And the events of the ancient Passover, having proceeded, if you, if you buy into my, my perspective here, having proceeded from the cross, naturally form a logical progression back to the cross. So therefore, his death is the holiday. Jesus doesn't fulfill Passover. Passover fulfills Jesus. And all of this means unequivocally that it was Jesus, the Son of God, before he became a man, who executed judgment on Egypt that night during the very first Passover. And it was also Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, who showed mercy to the faithful on that same night. Our Jesus, our Savior, the Almighty God, the justice and mercy meets at the blood of the Lamb, whether it's in Egypt or at the cross. It's the same thing. And that Jesus fulfilled the Passover completely is not news, of course. It may sound like news because modern-day Christians don't talk like this anymore for some reason, but it's not actually news. Our Scripture passage acknowledges this, and it tells us what to do about it. Paul tells us, therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Passover is an event entirely devoid of yeast or leaven or sin. Christ is is the true and ultimate Passover. Therefore, as Christians, we are unleavened by his blood. Now, we may not be perfect people, and if you thought that this was a perfect church, I came along and I ruined that for you because I'm not a perfect man. I imagine, if we're being honest, I'm not going to be the only one in the room to say that. Right? We may not be perfect people, but the Father sees us as perfect because we are covered by Jesus. And as such, we should, in fact, keep the feast, because the feast is Jesus. We should keep the feast, not a list of rituals or predetermined prayers or special foods, right? But the living Lord Jesus Christ. That's the feast. And we should walk with Jesus, not with the old leaven or sin, since we are new creations in Christ. Amen? But we should walk with the, not with the sin of malice or wickedness, as the scripture said, but with the, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Have you ever experienced or understood Jesus in this manner? As the fulfillment of everything. When he says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, have you stopped to consider the fullness of what he's saying here? I am every single way. I'm the only way because I cover the whole spread. I've got every single detail covered. You can't find a detail about salvation about which I'm not the fulfillment. That's what he's telling us. Every action of his life and death and rest and resurrection were done with you in mind. 
Doesn't that make your heart swell with love and gratitude towards your Lord and Savior today? He did all of this thinking about you. Christ is so perfectly complete. He is enough. He is sufficient. He is everything. He is all that you need. Somebody witness to me today. He's all that you need and everything that you need. And if we want him to return and take us home, then we need to start acting like we believe that. Christ is all-encompassingly sufficient. He leaves no room for fear because our lives are in his hands. And clearly, there is no detail that escapes his attention. Amen? I want to appeal to you today about the love of my Jesus. He gave his life for you. He took on your sin and went to the cross joyfully. That's what Hebrews says, right? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. He did what he did because he wants to spend eternity with you. And just so that you don't miss that point, he gave you 14 centuries of Passover ahead of time so that he could fulfill every single detail of it so that you know that he's got every aspect of you in the palm of his hands. And because he gave his life for us, I am praying that we're going to rejoice today in the privilege of giving our lives back to him. Amen? I'm going to pray. And then I'd like us to rise and joyfully sing our closing song. This is, not a, this is not supposed to be a solemn song, okay? This is a joyful song. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you so, so, so much that you have given us a Savior who is so perfect and so complete. Our hearts just sing with gratitude that salvation is too perfect to have been created by man. And my prayer for my brothers and my sisters who are gathered here today is that we are going to leave here and think about Christ not the same way that the common belief sees him not as divorced from the Old Testament prophecies that prove him, not as a creation of the church like he so often seems, but as the living Passover who did what he did to save us and spare us from that eternal death which we all deserve. My prayer is that each one of us will connect to our Lord in this manner, and I pray also for those in the world who are connected to Passover, but not to Jesus. And I pray that every single one of them, when they sit down to observe and celebrate their Passover, will no longer be ignorant that they are actually proclaiming Jesus Christ. And I pray that the world is going to wake up and you will give us a spirit to help the world wake up so that every one of us will be ready on that great day and our hearts will be filled with joy to hear that the creator of all things call our names. Forgive our sin, God. We know that this holiday is designed to make us introspective and to set us on the quest of ridding our lives of sin. But I, for one, know that there's no ridding my life of sin without Jesus. And I'm asking you to take over that job, God. I am very good at getting myself into sin. But only you are good at getting me out of it. Lord, I thank you so much for everything that you do. And I pray a blessing upon all of us gathered here today. I pray this blessing on all of the believing Christian world today. 
and tomorrow especially. Let each one of us truly connect to and stand in awe of he who died and yet lives again and forevermore. Bless each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, friends, remember, we do have a fire drill. But first I want you to stand up and sing to God. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Son of men and angels say, hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high, hallelujah. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia. Lives are given, our glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O oh death, is now thy sting, Alleluia. Loving Father, thank you so much, so much for all that we heard today. May we take that in our hearts, Lord, home with us. And throughout the rest of the week, we ask you now to bless the meal that we are going to partake of, and also, Lord, all those hands that prepared it. In Jesus' name, amen.